Feeling supersonic? It's back to the future for air travel as new passenger planes attempt to break the sound barrier. And the 1,000 kilometer an hour train ride will examine the hype around Hyperloop. I'm Martin Stanford. This is Inside. Welcome to Insight. It's more than 40 years since Concorde carried its first passengers across the Atlantic at more than twice the speed of sound. The golden era of supersonic flight saw a trip from London to New York take only three and a half hours. But all that speed and luxury came at a high price, not just for the passengers. And in 2003, the aircraft made its last trip. Now, supersonic travel could be back, as Insight senior correspondent Dana Lewis reports. A hundred passengers and all their baggage from London to New York in three hours. It was designed in the 60s and it's still way ahead probably now of anything. That combination of range, technical capability and comfort for the passengers. Which is almost the tragedy of it, that it, it was so far ahead of its time and it, it sits in retirement in Moscow. Indeed. Concorde, a joint project of the British and French governments. First flight, 1969. Retired, 2003. I'd like to welcome you on board this Concorde flight to Ganda. Our estimated flight time is 2 hours, 45 minutes. That was the beginning, not the end, of supersonic passenger travel. Today, there are a handful of companies working on the next generation of planes that can boast similar speeds of 22 miles a second. Boom is one of them, offering a 1,400 mile an hour plane and passengers what they value most, time. But if Boom can make it fly, it's years away from doing so. New designs, lighter composite materials, Boom is under development. For the last two and a half years, we've been working quietly on the design. Finally, the engineering is complete and we have started the build process. Arion is another company developing the next generation of supersonic passenger planes. Promising London to New York in just over four hours, saving two hours, 36 minutes. But while the planes exist in graphics, a real one hasn't been built or flown. And while they look fast and luxurious, the hurdles of making supersonic flight achievable for commercial airlines are daunting. We have the right stuff. 70 years ago, this coming October, Chuck Yeager broke the sound barrier in a plane that looked more like a rocket. The really big moment. Through the sound barrier. The first time ever in level flight. Glamorous Glennis, also known as X-1. To this day, military fighters keep the mock-up. just over 900 miles per hour, easily achievable by fast movers. But commercial airliners? There's only been the Concorde. American attempts never succeeded. The Russian Konkordsky crashed twice and was scrapped. While the British and French Concorde soared. I will remember my first takeoff for, well, forever, literally. Was it a good one? Uh, well, it's fine. <laughs> it's just trying to keep the thing back. Uh, it's like a, a thoroughbred racing horse. It just wants to gallop, and you can see how beautiful and sleek it looks. Jock Lowe was chief Concorde pilot for British Airways. He later became Concorde's commercial director. We walked and talked to Concorde, around the first supersonic he ever flew. It's now a museum piece at Brooklands, just outside of London. We asked him what makes supersonic airplanes so different, and he compared the technology to a moon landing. The nose itself pivots around that curved line, you see it, just, just in front of the light. Uh, so that moves, and it moves to five degrees for takeoff, and it moves to 12 and a half degrees for the landing. Otherwise, you would be one of the few pilots flying that never got to see the runway. Never got to see the <laughs> runway until we hit it. Four Olympus engines, and, and they're 
pretty special. Those air intakes, those sheets of metal there, mm -hmm. are fundamental to efficient supersonic flying. You have air that's going over Mach 1 and you have to slow, slow it, it down. down. Yeah. Otherwise? Yeah, otherwise the engine will disintegrate. Even the wings are different than any other commercial airliner. Delta wings sweep back towards the tail to find a scientific balance between enough lift versus low drag at speeds of 1,600 miles per hour, and the wings help create a deafening thunderclap as the plane breaks the sound barrier. So far, no one has found a way to eliminate the sonic boom. There's three booms, actually. There's a primary boom, which is the one that comes from the aeroplane, like the wake of a ship. It's like a cone uh, comes out. Then that boom can go up to the upper atmosphere and bounce down again. Uh, and then the one that's gone to the ground can bounce up and go up again. So you get a tertiary boom. The Concorde wasn't just fast. It's unlike any other aircraft in the sky. Imagine as it punched through the sound barrier, the airframe became so hot, it actually stretched 6 to 12 inches. And this aircraft guzzled fuel, 62,000 pounds of jet fuel an hour, compared to an Airbus which sips about 5,000 pounds. For almost 30 years, the Concorde flew without incident. But in 2000, one crashed on takeoff from Paris when it ran over an object on the runway and a fuel tank caught fire. A hundred passengers plus crew died. Good morning, Thank you. Good morning. Nice to see you. The Concorde was officially retired in 2003. Aviation reporter Robert Hager was on the last flight. There's a certain luxury to uh, watching that Mach sign go up from Mach 1 to Mach 2, and you're so high above 40,000, 50,000 feet, and the sky turns dark. It's kind of magic. Hager is skeptical that commercial supersonic airplanes can be profitable. I mean, they're talking uh, after the year 20,000 or so. I think it'd be way beyond that, that we get to the point where commercial aviation would again attempt something like this. People say 2020, do you think they're being I a little... I think they're being amazingly optimistic. Uh, when you think that it took seven years from this aeroplane's first flight, the Concorde, to its commercial fl first commercial flight, anything less would be difficult to achieve. So I think that's pretty optimistic, but let's hope. Designers have proven they can manufacture faster than sound passenger planes. The Concorde flew that flag. But that was a generation ago, and future supersonic will have to be quieter, cleaner, and profitable as they punch Mach 1 and beyond. I'm Dana Lewis, reporting for Insight. Well, to discuss that further, I'm joined now by Anthony Cuthbertson, who's a technology reporter for Newsweek. Anthony, um, it is extraordinary to look back at the technology they were using then. It's probably, although it came into service 40 years ago, the technology itself is probably 50, 60 years out of date, isn't it? So just in terms of the computing power on board the modern airliner, that will have changed beyond recognition. That will have changed um, massively, but also in terms of developing the aircraft, um, that has had uh, significant improvements thanks to the computing power. Rather than using big expensive wind tunnels, for example, they can um, simulate right. this on the computer computer, on computers, yeah. which is far cheaper and also far quicker. So um, in the, they said there that it took seven years for the first plane to become commercial. I think that can be uh, knocked down. You think that, that time ban can be shortened this time? Absolutely. I Let's talk about some of the materials, though. I mean, Concorde was put together. Um, there are suggestions that these newer aircraft might use, what, graphite-based or completely new components? Carbon fibre is what carbon Boom fiber. are using. Um, Concorde used aluminium, so carbon fibre is a lot lighter, which allows it to go a little bit faster. Um, and is more efficient in the air. So we heard about that heating fuel. question, didn't it? That the whole plane stretched yes. by, or you know, several centimeters. Um, would that affect the new? The new materials wouldn't have that. They'd be able to withstand the heat better. They would they? be. Well, Concorde needed a special paint to withstand that heat, <laughs> so I'm sure they're going to need to put a few coats of that on first. Yeah. yeah. But the new materials will be able to withstand the temperatures generated by air friction. Absolutely. At yeah. speeds. What about the powerful engines? Um, has jet engine technology advanced in the intervening years? Not that much. Technology only advances when you've got bright minds working on it. And for decades, they were focused on other things. And it's only in the last few years that they've started picking it up again. So it's, it, well, we'll have to see. 
the, the jet engine technology that they used hasn't really advanced very much? No, in fact, in, with Boom, the um, company that Richard Branson is throwing his money behind, they actually use modified jet engines that are used on commer commercial planes uh, that fly in the skies today. And they believe they'll work OK. Yeah. Although, as we heard, they have to make arrangements, don't they? For, I mean, we all know jet engines need air coming into them in order to go out the other end. But you cannot just put supersonic air through a jet engine. No, they'll need um, massive uh, air intakes to soften the blow of that air coming in at Mach 1 or Mach 2, in fact, um, especially when they're travelling at faster speeds. Yeah, and the ambition is, well, here's, here's the um, argument for hanging in the air. Is, is there a market for it? Because certainly when Concorde was still flying in its later years, we know it's a very complex set of circumstances, wasn't it? 9-11 uh, then sort of brought all air travel to a, mm -hmm. to a halt for a while, let alone luxury air travel. The question would be, at what price point could any company bring this in that isn't just ridiculous and beyond anyone's pocket? Well, Boom claimed to be able to do it for $5,000 a seat, which is about £3,500, yeah. which would be remarkable um, because that's even cheaper than Concorde. But there are only 40 seats on the planes, and all these new planes are even smaller than Concorde, which was small itself. It only had 100 seats. Yes. So it is going to be sort of the cost of a business class seat these days, um, but it will be vastly limited to who can actually fly on it. And the routes as well will be limited. They still haven't solved some of the original problems, such as the sonic boom. Well, let's talk a bit about that. The sonic boom is inescapable, is it? Or, or if, how well, do they get round it? Um, it is largely inescapable, although NASA has been working on a new technology with its X-planes that softens it, but it still makes a noise. And that will mean that routes will be limited to transoceanic, so London to New York or right. Paris to Washington, like Concord was. So you Concord stay was. subsonic over land, so you don't disturb the population. And once you're over the sea, doesn't the reverberation, as we heard the pilot explain there, it, it's still audible, isn't it, back on land, wherever you do it? It is, but it doesn't cause as many problems. You say it disturbs the population. Uh, Concord used to be banned from flying over Saudi Arabia at supersonic speeds because they were worried about it affecting mating patterns with camels. So it's not, and there were also um, <laughs> problems with chickens laying eggs that they thought it might affect. Yeah. Um, and it also had ridiculous takeoff noise, doesn't it? And this yeah. is, comes from somebody who used to live, well, still lives near Heathrow Airport in London, and we used to remember it. You could hear it from several miles away. Is the nature of the thrust involved to get an aircraft, this, this aircraft like this off the ground inevitable that the engines will make an awful lot of noise? It will be takeoff and landing as well, um, coming into JFK in New York was always a, um, a bit of an issue and there were problems. There had to be diplomatic visits to actually make sure that that happened. So one wonders if this is really viable from all sorts of arguments. With all the arguments going on about uh, greener travel and more environmentally friendly, surely the um, <coughs> companies Boom and, and others are going to be up facing an uphill struggle with all this. They will. Um, it's <coughs> got a little bit cleaner. They say it's a little uh, more energy efficient, but flying at that height at 10 miles in the sky they say that that can actually uh, harm the ozone even more. So, and the studies haven't be really been conclusive, but... Um, so that's a further challenge to this. Exactly, and when Concord first came out, that wasn't such an issue. Now, green is a big thing that everyone now, must consider. Now, the other system, which isn't anything like as developed, but the other sort of bit of theory is that rather than fly all the way, say, from London to Sydney in Australia or, you know, another long distance, why not do a great loop and basically go into space and come back down again? And there are people thinking about that, aren't they, as to whether they could make that sort of rocket-like travel commercially available. There are. Um, flying from London to mm. Sydney, I think, in 10 hours is the projected time for technology like that. But again, it's still hypothetical. It's, um, it can be done, but whether it's actually commercially viable is a big question mark. And if it is, it will be on a very limited scale for a very small... Again, a few number of seats available on each of these flights. Exactly. And who knows what kind of cost. And a few number of planes as well. There are only 14 Concords in operation. They're planning more of these planes, but it will still be fewer seats. Anthony, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Anthony Cuthbertson. Thank you. This is Inside. Coming up, travelling at 1,000 kilometres an hour without leaving the ground. We'll look at the future of supersonic trains.